you for joining us, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Wills, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations. Um, I want to mention that I'll be recording this webinar for a few folks who are unable to join us at this time so that they can watch it later. Um, so for now, please mute yourself. But if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand and um, ask Professor Thibodeau throughout the presentation. She's happy to take questions throughout and not just waiting till the end. So today we are going to welcome Professor Allison Thibodeau. She's an Associate Professor of Earth Sciences and she's been at Dickinson since 2015. Today she's going to discuss, was there a turquoise trail? Rethinking ancient turquoise mining and exchange in the US Southwest and Mexico. So um, her research in this area has changed our understanding of both the nature and extent of the uh, long distance contacts between the Mesoamerican and Southwestern societies. So with that, welcome, Allison. Thanks, Laura. Um, thanks for alumni relations for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, some of the my favorite aspects of my research. Um, I see some, some even some former students in the audience, at least one of which has actually participated in some of this research with me. Um, so that's always uh, uh, exciting to see. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, my research in the southwestern US and Mexico surrounding the mining and exchange of the mineral turquoise. So this picture here is a picture of the Canyon Creek turquoise mine. Um, this is in central Arizona. Um, you can actually see the sort of talus slope here, the broken up chunks of rock where you can um, still find little nodules of turquoise today. Um, this mine is not on public land, however, so it's not generally accessible to the public. Before I begin, um, I just like to have a slide where I acknowledge all the people who have helped in some way or contributed in some way to the research I'm going to show you today. So I've been working on research related to turquoise since about 2007. So for well over a decade. Um, and in that time, I have only been able to um, even work on this topic because of the cooperation and expertise of uh, uh, many, many, many other people. So I just wanna acknowledge some of the main contributors to the research um, you're going to see here on this slide at the beginning. So I just wanna start off with a map to orient us geographically um, and, and, and introduce to you the areas uh, we're going to be talking about. So this is a map of Southwestern North America and in the blue circles are um, some of the major known turquoise deposits. And you can see that most of the known turquoise deposits in Southwestern New uh, uh, North America are located in the uh, US Southwest. There are a few in Northern Mexico. This map is not a comprehensive uh, map of all known turquoise deposits, but it shows you um, many of the major ones. And so, in this presentation, I am going to be continually referring to um, an area I will call the Southwest or the Greater Southwest. And when I say that, what I mean is essentially the Southwestern corner of the United States, but archeologically this area also incorporates Northern Mexico. So the, the geographic terms I'll use don't correlate perfectly with modern political boundaries. And in this area, this, the, the greater Southwest, um, the use of turquoise has deep roots. So turquoise objects begin to appear in the archeological record as early as about 500 AD or so. Um, although the, the really prolific use of turquoise doesn't come until later. So I wanna show you some just pictures of objects um, from the uh, archaeological record um, uh, that demonstrate the sort of use of turquoise by pre-Hispanic groups in this region. So um, often 
uh, turquoise appears in the form of mosaics. So this mosaic is not intact, but what you actually see here is um, the, a carved glycimerous shell in the shape of a back of a frog. And uh, the turquoise tiles you see, right, would have been applied to the back of the surface. You see one red tile in the center here. Um, this is probably a clay stone or an argillite. Um, and in um, at least ancient Puebloan, um, in modern Puebloan thought, um, the color turquoise is often used alongside the color red. Um, and that has to do with certain dualities um, in their, um, in their uh, cosmological system. Here is an intact mosaic. Um, this is from an, a site known as Kanishba. So again, you see the mosaic tiles with the red, um, this is, I believe, a piece of spondylus shell in the center. And when we think about turquoise and we think about this archaeological area we call the Southwest, one of the most notable archaeological sites that's famous for the turquoise that was recovered from it is a site called Chaco Canyon, which is in northwestern New Mexico. Um, Chaco Canyon is uh, uh, well known. Um, it's a national historic park and it preserves these structures we call great houses. And this is one of the most famous uh, great houses. It's called Pueblo Benito. And one of the most extraordinary, extraordinary features of this great house was essentially a mortuary crypt that was um, discovered and excavated in the early 19th century. And literally tens of thousands of turquoise objects were recovered from this mortuary crypt. So this is just um, a, a picture I took back in about 2009, 2010 um, in a drawer at the American Museum of Natural History. So they curate lots of the objects that came from these excavations of this great house and they store essentially most of the turquoise that was recovered from it. So you can just open these drawers at the museum and you just see bags and bags and bags of turquoise beads and pendants and other objects. Um, and so Pueblo Benito is kind of extraordinary for the concentration of turquoise that was present in um, the one of the mortuary crypts within that structure. So this speaks to the importance, the symbolic, the ritual importance of turquoise to ancient pre-Hispanic groups in this region. And so um, turquoise was an important material, um, an important geologic material in the, the greater Southwest, but it also appears in um, in parts of Mesoamerica. And so when I refer to Mesoamerica, I'm mostly referring in this case to central Mexico, but we actually, Mesoamerica extends well to the south and turquoise is actually present um, both in uh, central southern Mexico and um, in, in um, uh, countries like Belize, Guatemala. There are lots of Mayan sites that have turquoise as well. And one of the main questions um, that archaeologists have about these regions is how they might have been linked in the past by long distance trade networks. So were materials moved, for example, between the greater Southwest and the Mesoamerican region? What materials, how frequently, what was the nature of this interaction between these groups? And we know there must have been some interaction between Mesoamerican societies and Southwestern ones in the past, because we see clear evidence of Mesoamerican uh, materials in Southwestern archeological sites. So this was actually, this, this image actually also comes from Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon. And what you're looking at is the skeleton of a scarlet macaw. Um, and so scarlet macaws are, are tropical lowland birds. Um, and so this bird would have had to have been imported at some point from Mesoamerica. There is some evidence that scarlet macaws may have been raised in the Southwest. Um, so some birds, uh, they might've tried to, to, to breed them, but clear evidence of Southwestern uh, society somehow interacting right with the Mesoamerican region. Awesome. We have yeah. a 
question. I'm wondering if turquoise was more prized than gold. So uh, as far as I know, there's no use of gold in the Southwestern US. So it wouldn't really even be a, a comparison. Um, it was certainly a, a highly valued um, by pre-Hispanic societies. Um, so it would have been a, a really important, still is for many groups today, an extremely important material and an important color. Um, and so you could think of it as, as comparable to gold, um, but, but Southwestern groups, um, unlike Mesoamerican groups, never used um, or even probably had access to gold. So one of the other um, uh, pieces or lines of evidence for interaction between Southwestern and Mesoamerican groups um, is evidence that Southwestern groups drank cacao. So cacao is another tropical lowland plant had to have been imported over long distances. And this again, this image comes from Chaco Canyon. Um, it comes from Pueblo Benito. And what you see are what we call cylindrical jars. They actually look like this. Um, they're a special form of draw, jar and residue analysis on these ceramics um, uh, suggests that these particular cylindrical vessels were used to drink cacao, um, which might have been important in uh, particular rituals. That research was actually done in collaboration with the Hershey Company, so a little central Pennsylvania connection here. But again, clear evidence for at least some interaction. And then we see other objects in the Southwest. Um, that were imported from Mesoamerica or imported over long distances. Um, so copper bells are one of them. Copper bells are a particular object that's uh, very strongly linked to West Mexico. So uh, West Mexican groups um, as early as about 600 AD acquire the technology or develop the technology to smelt metals. Um, so Southwestern groups didn't smelt metals um, but they did import some metals from Mesoamerica, um, including what you see here, what we call copper bells. And there are some shells here, such as spondylus shells, like you see on this necklace that come from organisms in the Gulf of California or off the coast of, of Mexico. So we know that um, through the presence of these objects in Southwestern archeological sites that there was some interaction. And it's often been proposed that Southwestern groups might have traded turquoise to the South in exchange for these goods, such as scarlet macaws, cacao, or copper bells. And so um, for, for the past hundred years, um, lots of kind of archeological thought has assumed that the turquoise we see in Mesoamerica derived from the greater Southwest. And that's, due to both evidence of Mesoamerican goods in the Southwest, but also because there aren't really known turquoise mines in Mesoamerica, right? If you look at this map, we see this uh, distinction. And so there are some really fabulous examples of Mesoamerican turquoise mosaics. Um, uh, a collection of these objects is held by the British Museum. So this is the famous double-headed serpent. Um, uh, it's attributed to either uh, Aztec or Mishtec uh, cultural regions. This is another turquoise mosaic. Um, this mosaic was recovered from a cave in the state of Pueblo, Puebla, Mexico, um, uh, in the early 19th or the early 20th century. Um, and this now resides in the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, which is part of the Smithsonian. Again, you see um, the really clever use of turquoise of different shades to create different design features. This is actually a ceremonial shield. And so the wooden backing with the holes you see around the center would have had, for example, feathers attached to it. This is another example from the collections of the Smithsonian. This is a little more um, uh, not in as good of condition, but you can see the turquoise mosaic applied to this mask. And we know from some 
uh, written records that, for example, the Aztecs used turquoise. So these are pages of uh, what's called the Codex Mendoza. And it records essentially tribute given to the Aztecs by the provinces, the outlying provinces of the Aztec empire. And so you can see in the lower right hand corner, a string of turquoise beads. Um, you can also see a turquoise shield. So we know um, uh, groups like the Aztecs used turquoise. And so this idea that turquoise was this material that linked these regions, um, uh, this idea is, is relatively old. It has been suggested even by members of the scientific community since the 1850s or so. And it's made its way into the popular imagination. So if you drive through New Mexico, you can drive on the turquoise trail. Um, and, and the goal of my research was to determine, did this trail exist? Was there the long distance movement of this material? And so this idea that turquoise was traded from the Southwest to Mesoamerica um, is first mentioned in the scientific literature in the mid 19th century. So this is an excerpt of an article from the American Journal of Science. And it describes turquoise deposits in central New Mexico in an area called the Cerritos Hills. And you can see the title of this article, the Chachuitl of the ancient Mexicans. So Chachuitl is a nautical word um, for turquoise. Um, and so this article is implying, right, that ancient Mesoamerican groups must have acquired their turquoise from this New Mexican mine. This is a news article from the late 19th century, um, which describes the discovery of turquoise mines in Southeastern California. Um, and so uh, if you kind of zoom in on the text of this article, as they're describing these turquoise mines, they say there have been found the mines of the ancients long lost to knowledge. And so the secret source from which the Aztecs drew their supply of turquoise is no longer a secret locked in the mists of the past. So people find these ancient turquoise mines and they immediately think, oh, these are the mines that were being, that were supplying the turquoise to uh, Mesoamerican groups. Um, in 1915, a scientist named Joseph, Joseph Pogue wrote a whole treatise on turquoise. It was quite comprehensive, talked about turquoise deposits all over the world. Um, and he noted that the turquoise deposits of the Cerritos Hills in New Mexico, which are the best known and perhaps most widely studied ancient turquoise mines, um, uh, you know, almost certainly in his view, must have supplied all the turquoise used by pre-Hispanic groups in the Southwest, but also in Mexico um, because of just the massive scale of turquoise mining in that region. So eventually this idea makes its way into the scientific literature. So this is an article by an archeologist named Phil Weigand and a chemist named Garmin Harbottle. And they set out to try to trace the origin of turquoise artifacts through chemical means. So what they did was they went all around the Southwest and they collected turquoise from different deposits. And then they measured essentially the elemental composition of that turquoise. So they were looking for distinct elemental signatures that might distinguish turquoise from one mine from turquoise from another mine. And so they did this with dozens and dozens of turquoise deposits and they analyzed hundreds and hundreds of pieces of turquoise from archaeological sites. And they published um, a, a series of maps, one of which I'm showing here. So this is actually from a Scientific American article in 1992. And you can see it shows turquoise deposits and it shows some archeological sites in the orange circles. And then there's a bunch of arrows going everywhere. So this was sort of a visual summary of their findings showing that turquoise appeared to be moving between the Southwest and Mesoamerica. 
The only problem with this image is that they actually never published the data that supported these conclusions. So there's actually no way to verify um, whether or not their efforts to fingerprint turquoise based on the elements present in the mineral um, uh, were really robust or rigorous or whether or not we uh, can trust these conclusions. So my goal was to try to reevaluate these ideas with, um, with some different types of measurements. So my work and the work I'm going to describe in the next 20 or minutes or so had really two goals. Um, my first goal when I began working on turquoise was to develop a method for the, determining the source of a turquoise artifact. So just like Bill Wigan and Gar Garmin Harbottle did in the 80s and 90s, I wanted to see is there some unique aspect of the chemistry of turquoise that might distinguish turquoise that's mined in one location from turquoise that's mined in another. And we could use that as a sort of fingerprint to trace turquoise from an archeological site, we could measure certain um, chemical characteristics of it and link it to a specific geologic source. And then um, my second major goal was once I figured out how to distinguish um, between turquoise mines, whether or not um, we could test this idea that Mesoamerican turquoise artifacts actually derive from mines in the Southwest. Okay, so what is turquoise, right? So turquoise is a, is a blue-green mineral um, and chemically it's a copper aluminum phosphate. Um, so copper, aluminum, and phosphorus are, the, are kind of the three major elements that make up turquoise. They're what we need to sort of make the mineral itself. But turquoise is really part of a family of related minerals. Um, and so turquoise is closely related or forms sort of a, what we call in, in geology a solid solution series with minerals like calcasiderite. So just to sort of show you here, Right, the difference between a mineral like calcasiderite and turquoise is essentially whether or not the mineral contains aluminum or iron. If you look um, at the formulas for those two minerals, that's the only difference. And so turquoise is really a family of related minerals. And if you look at turquoise, you know, even this is a this is a turquoise artifact here, you can see that the color, right, even along this artifact changes, right? Turquoise blue, right? Not all turquoise is sort of the traditional turquoise blue. It can kind of grade into dark green um, or much lighter blue colors. And these color gradations are probably related to um, factors like the presence of iron or the absence of iron or the presence of elements like zinc. Um, uh, in the actual formula of the mineral you see here. So when we talk about turquoise, um, we're actually talking to sort of about a family of related minerals, which have so somewhat different appearances, but all form in a, a similar way. And turquoise forms essentially via the weathering of other copper bearing rocks. Um, so in geology, we call this a supergene mineral. It means it's related to weathering. And so what happens is groundwater or rainwater percolates through rocks that sort of have the elemental ingredients for turquoise. And if you have cycles, right, where water percolates then dries out, that water that's percol percolating through those rocks, sometimes when it, that water dries out, right, it will precipitate minerals like turquoise. So turquoise is found in at very shallow depths. It's often visible at the surface, but most turquoise deposits are, are no more than 30 meters deep. Um, this makes them accessible to pre-Hispanic groups in the Southwest, right? That are, you know, what we might categorize as stone age in the sense that, right, they're using stone tools to do their mining. They don't have, you know, metal axes or picks. Um, to extract minerals from rock. They're using stones to do their mining or they're doing something we call fire cracking the rock um, in order to extract the turquoise. 
Uh, turquoise is it's a, mostly limited to arid or semi-arid regions worldwide. And this has to do with the climatic factors that help essentially um, uh, uh, promote the formation of turquoise in certain regions. So I want to show you what some of these mines actually look like. So here's sort of a close up of the mines that I studied. Um, this was when I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona. And I'm going to show you pictures of four different um, uh, turquoise uh, deposits or, or the turquoise deposits from four different areas. So you can get a sense of what this looks like on the ground. So these is what, this is what the turquoise mines of the Halloran Springs district. So this is a look like today. So this is Southeastern California. All these areas that you're gonna see have been impacted by either historical or modern mining. So their configuration, their appearance is not exactly what it would have been a thousand years ago, but you can just see, right? That there's just these shallow pits dug into the surface here, right? There's nothing too crazy going on. Um, the, the minerals available very close to the surface. Um, this is an image from central New Mexico from the turquoise mines of the Cerrillos district. And this is perhaps um, the largest pre-Hispanic turquoise mine known in the Southwest. This is a, a mine called Mount Chachuitl. The person you see in the picture um, uh, is a man by the name of Bill Baxter, who lives in this area and has done a lot of historical research on how the mines of the Cerritos Hills were used. Um, but you can see behind him that the big pit he's standing in is actually completely dug for turquoise. And we think it's mostly pre-Hispanic in its configuration. And so um, just the sheer quantity of material that had to have been removed from this particular mine is just extraordinary. There's other turquoise mines throughout this area we call the Cerritos Hills. So these are not just discrete features on a landscape. Turquoise deposits in a single area might be spread over several square miles. So this is what we call the Tiffany mine. So in the late 19th century, Tiffany and Co. Uh, popularized uh, turquoise among Americans. And so they bought up several mines throughout the Southwest. There's multiple mines with the name the Tiffany mine. Um, this is just one of them in the Cerritos Hills. And this is actually below ground in the Tiffany mine. This is Bill Baxter again with Doug Magnus, who is a jeweler who partially owns the turquoise claims in this area. So this just gives you a sense of some of the historic mining for turquoise that's gone on. This is the Canyon Creek mine. So this is, or this is at least one of the turquoise areas in the Canyon Creek mine. So this is on the White Mountain Fort Apache Reservation in Arizona. And the arrow is just pointing to the talus slope of a mine. And so you can see that these mines are not necessarily large features on a landscape. Um, and so they could be destroyed quite easily um, by modern mines or historic mining methods. So the mines we see today, right, are just a subset of what must have existed in the past. Um, so it doesn't take much to sort of erase a mine from a landscape because they're not necessarily large features. These are other pictures of other um, mines in the Canyon Creek area. So you can actually see here, right, uh, kind of caves dug into the cliff surface. Here's just a shot into a cave. In some of these areas, you can still find the tools that they used for mining. So this is um, uh, one of my collaborators, Dave Killick from the University of Arizona. He's holding up a hammer stone um, uh, that would have been used in the past to extract turquoise. You can see some additional hammer stones here um, sitting on kind of the flat rock. Um, I did get to bring Dickinson students here in 2018. So um, these are former Dickinson alumni, Allison Curley and Amanda Kale. Um, they came out to do research with me in Arizona and they got the chance to see this kind of extraordinary, extraordinary mine. So Dickinson alumni webinar, I had to put in some pictures of Dickinson alumni. This is a historic picture of a turquoise mine from uh, uh, um, 
uh, northwestern Arizona. It's called the Mineral Park District. And all the, the rocks you see on the ground surrounding this person are hammerstones. Um, so I, I put in a picture of this mine because it's a good example of what modern mining has done to the, the pre-Hispanic mining record. So this is a picture of this area we call Ithaca Peak around 1964. Um, and that's when this picture here was taken um, within one of the mine shafts. If you went here today, so this is just a shot from Google Earth. Um, Ithaca Peak, right, is in one of these yellow pins. It's now an open pit copper mine. So these mines don't actually exist anymore. Our samples of turquoise from these ancient mines, right, come um, just from museum collections or private collections that had this turquoise before the mine was actually destroyed. So these are, this is what essentially the circle locations are, are what became of some of the ancient mines in this area. All right, so my first question, um, I see there's maybe a question in the chat. Oh, someone from Silver City, New Mexico, that's exciting. Um, so you do know the areas I'm talking about pretty well. Um, so my main question is, can we distinguish chemically one turquoise deposit from another? Is there some way we can sort of fingerprint different deposits so that when we find artifacts in the archeological record, um, we can tie them to a specific mine? And so, how we decided to do this, and I won't belabor the technical aspects of this too much, is we decided not to use elemental concentrations um, in order to fingerprint turquoise. We decided to use isotopes, right? So isotopes are just different sort of flavors of a chemical element. Um, so we used isotopes of lead and isotopes of strontium. And you can see I've put some what we call isotope ratios here on this slide. And so in natural materials, um, there are four naturally occurring stable isotopes of lead. And the only thing that really distinguishes them from one another is their weight. So it's really the, the, um, uh, the atomic weight you see um, in the superscripted text here. So some, some isotopes of lead, right, have, are essentially lead 204. Other isotopes are lead 206, lead 207, lead 208. These are basically all atoms of lead. They just weigh different amounts. Um, and the same with strontium. And we picked these two particular isotope systems because they vary in um, uh, natural materials quite widely. And so if we look at different types of rocks with different geological histories, they'll have different proportions of these isotopes in them. And because turquoise forms from the weathering, right, of rocks at the surface of the earth, any trace amounts of lead or strontium in the turquoise just sort of um, uh, derive from their surrounding geologic environment. So the turquoise ends up with an isotope fingerprint that reflects that of its geologic environment. So I'm, I'm going to maybe skip past this slide, um, but I, I will just talk about it very briefly. Um, different isotopes of lead and, different, and, and one isotope of strontium are actually created through the radioactive decay of long-lived isotopes of uranium, thorium, and in the case of strontium, rubidium. Um, and so it's this radioactive decay process that helps produce natural variations in the abundance of these isotopes in natural materials. So some of the plots, I'm, the plots I'm gonna show you today are all isotope ratio plots. They're showing you the proportion of different isotopes in the turquoise, and that's all you really need to know. So in order to do this research, I apologize to Allison. I had to put another picture of her um, in the lab. We have to take the turquoise artifacts. Um, we take just a tiny piece of turquoise, um, maybe half the size of a piece of a pencil eraser, and we grind it up and we dissolve it. Um, and then we take that solution and we separate the lead and the strontium out of it and we're able to make our isotope measurements. So this all has to be done in very clean conditions um, in uh, uh, 
setting into what we call clean labs. And so here's Allison doing some of this work. Um, this is at the University of Arizona. And uh, the short story is that we were successful in being able to distinguish, use these isotopes to distinguish among turquoise deposits in the Southwest. This is just a screenshot of the paper um, that reported these results. And I'm just gonna share a few of these results with you here. So we studied turquoise from all the mines shown on this slide. So here I've named the mines, um, but we don't really care about the names. So I've color coded the mines, uh, mines in different colors with different colors or different symbols, those groups reflect mines that share certain geological characteristics. And so rather than talking about the names of the mines themselves, we can actually divide the turquoise deposits of the Southwest into three to four groups um, based on sort of the, the geologic history of the turquoise deposits themselves. And so this makes it easy so we don't have to talk about specific mine names. So let's just look at what these isotope ratios actually look like. If we compare isotope ratios of deposits in group one to group two to group three. So I'm going to first show you some strontium isotope results. So this is a plot that shows what we call the 87 to 86 strontium ratio of turquoise from different mines throughout the southwest. And you'll notice that the mines are grouped and colored right together. And so what I want you to notice about this graph, so if you look on the x-axis, right, you have this measure of this 87 strontium to 86 strontium ratio. All I want you to notice, right, is that turquoise deposits in what we called group one and group two, they all have what we would consider to be, in this case, higher 87, 86 strontium ratios compared to turquoise deposits in group three. So there's essentially right um, a, a broad difference regionally in the isotope characteristics of the turquoise, right? So these are the deposits of group one, group two, right? They're in the three corners region of California, Nevada, Arizona, and in Southeastern Arizona. And these rocks all share particular geologic characteristics. Um, you don't have to worry about the terminology here, but the rocks in which the turquoise occurs um, have a specific range of ages. We can then look at turquoise deposits, right? Um, the, the remaining turquoise deposits, which have a different strontium isotope signature. Um, and we notice, right, that these deposits are, are geographically clustered. So the strontium isotope indicator appears to distinguish between, you know, deposits in, in one region of the Southwest from deposits in another region. And these all share common geological characteristics. So strontium isotopes kind of distinguish broadly between turquoise from sort of two different regions. Let's look at what lead isotopes can tell us just as an example here. So the lead isotope system is, is very powerful because we have many different isotope ratios to work with. So I'm just gonna show you um, one lead isotope plot here to sort of demonstrate to you how this works. So. Um, here I'm plotting two different lead isotope ratios against one another, and you can see where deposits in what we call group one plot. This is where deposits in group two plot on the same graph. So remember, deposits in group one and group two had the same range of strontium isotope signatures, but their lead isotopes are very different. So again, we see these isotope indicators essentially allowing us to distinguish turquoise from one region from turquoise from another region within the Southwest. And so essentially um, uh, there are geological reasons that we see this difference, but this allows us to distinguish between turquoise in these two groupings. Okay, 
Um, so I hope I've convinced you that these isotope indicators distinguish regionally between turquoise deposits. Uh, but I also want to show you that in some cases they they provide us with unique signatures for specific deposits. So let's just look at some turquoise deposits in group three. So remember that group three had its a distinctive strontium isotope ratio, those turquoise deposits that distinguish them from other deposits in the Southwest. And if we look at lead lead isotope plots of turquoise deposits in group three, we see that in lead isotope space, these deposits are actually completely distinct. Um, and so the actual size of the symbols is greater than the error on the measurements. So there's no overlap um, among any of the, the turquoise deposits in group three in lead isotope space. So not only can we distinguish regionally between turquoise deposits, we can in some cases pinpoint specific deposits because they have specific isotope signatures. Okay, so let's get back to our main research question here, right? So we can use these isotope ratios to dis discriminate between turquoise sources. Um, and we can actually show that these isotope ratios vary geographically just based on differences in the geologic setting of the, of the deposits. So once we showed that isotopes could distinguish among, among deposits, we could look at archeological artifacts um, to determine their source. So let's get back to our main research question. Did some form of turquoise trade link Mesoamerican and Southwestern societies? If this is true, we should be able to measure the isotope ratios of Mesoamerican turquoise artifacts, and they should have isotope ratios that look like deposits in the Southwest. So in order to um, acquire, so a lot of um, Mesoamerican turquoise objects are, are look like this. They're beautiful, fabulous mosaics, and museum curators will not let you, you know, pick a mo piece of mosaic uh, off the object to measure because this is a destructive technique. And so we had to get a little creative in order to acquire the samples to actually do this project. Luckily, um, that shield I just show, showed you and the other objects that were collected with it, when you look in the collections, there's actually a jar of loose adhesive material and loose turquoise mosaic fragments. Um, that we were allowed to sample for this project. So this is my collaborator, Franny Burdan. She is an expert in all things Aztec. Um, and you can see here, we're looking at these big chunks of adhesive material and that there's some very, very tiny turquoise mosaic tiles that we're, we're trying to pull out. So we were allowed to analyze five mosaic tiles um, that were associated with these Smithsonian mosaics. We were also able to study some turquoise mosaic tiles from Tenochtitlan, right, which was the capital um, uh, of the Aztec Empire. And we were able to look at a structure in Tenochtitlan called the Templo, Templo Mayor. So the Templo Mayor was the ceremonial center of the Aztec Empire. And this temple has multiple layers of construction, but as they essentially um, built new parts of this temple, they would essentially um, create caches um, where they would put kind of valuable materials. And a lot of those offerings that they um, created, right, contained turquoise. So we were able to work with archeologists um, at the Templo Mayor in order to get turquoise from these offerings. So um, here I've listed the offering numbers we got turquoise from. You can see the associated dates. Um, so the objects we look at date um, to about uh, the late 15th century, early 16th century. And what do these look like? Um, so this is actually uh, an offering that it, it's actually the burial of, uh, of some sort of canid. So you can see the skeleton here. Um, I'm not sure if it was a dog or a wolf, 
um, but the animal was wearing turquoise ear flares. Um, but the wooden backings of those ear flares had completely decayed away, leaving loose mosaic tiles. So we were able to sample mosaic tiles from, from this offering and from several others. Um, here's another turquoise object from an offering. You can see that um, the, the object itself right, has um, uh, survived the ravages of time, but, but not in perfect condition. Um, this is something called a turquoise bird. Um, again, right, this object dates to the late 15th century. And here's sort of just an image of some of the tiles we were able to examine from these offerings in the Temple Mayor. You can see that they're very small in size. Um, this can make it difficult to actually do the measurement, but we were surprisingly successful um, in, in being able to make these measurements on extremely small pieces. And so what were our results? So we measured the isotope ratios of these objects from the Temple Mayor, um, from uh, tesserae associated with these Smithsonian mosaics. And this plot here shows you just the strontium isotope ratios. And it shows it on what we call a box and whisker plot, which just shows you essentially the statistical distribution of the measurements. And so what I want you to notice here, right, is on the left-hand side, we have the measurements of turquoise tesserae from, um, from Mesoamerican objects. So those are in the red. And then you can look at the range of strontium isotope ratios that we've measured on turquoise samples from the Southwest. And what you should take away from this is that these isotope signatures are completely different. Um, in fact, most of the Mesoamerican objects had strontium isotope ratios that were lower than any geologic or archaeological material we've measured in the Southwest to date. So this was the first clue that perhaps the turquoise in these from that was used in Mesoamerica may not derive from the Southwest. But let's keep digging here. Here's another isotope plot. So here I'm plotting a strontium isotope ratio versus a lead isotope ratio. And in the circles here are just sort of all the turquoise from the Southwest, the geologic turquoise samples that we've measured um, plotted together in one color. If we compare the, the signature of um, turquoise from these Mesoamerican contexts, we see again that it plots in a part of the graph that's distinct. The other interesting observation about, um, about the distribution of isotope ratios in the Mesoamerican turquoise objects is that they largely cluster together. And that tells me that most of the, the turquoise we analyze either comes from the same deposit or it comes from a group of geologically related deposits. So the takeaway here again is that Mesoamerican turquoise um, or turquoise used by particularly the Aztecs and the Mixtecs is geochemically distinct from turquoise in the Southwest. And so this was a really surprising result. And so I want to kind of put this in a little more context for you. So this is just a map of the Aztec empire. So the star in the middle of the map is Tenochtitlan. And then you can see mapped out here, essentially provinces of the Aztec empire, um, tributary provinces, strategic provinces, but in green are the provinces that according to written records, um, gave turquoise tribute to the central as to the Aztecs. And what's interesting about these provinces is that none of these provinces are in locations where we know of any turquoise mines. So it's not clear um, whether or not these provinces were able to mine turquoise locally, or if they were acquiring turquoise through trade and then um, that turquoise then was being given to the Aztec empire as tribute. <clears throat> These images from the Codex Mendoza that I showed you at the beginning of this talk um, 
uh, show these turquoise, this turquoise tribute coming from these different provinces. I'm not going to try to say the names of some of these provinces because I never pronounce it correctly. But you can see in the middle panel here, there's a bowl of turquoise stones. Um, in the bottom panel, you can see, for example, a turquoise mask on the far right. And then um, uh, here on this page of the Codex Mendoza, you can see tributes, uh, a tribute um, that shows a string of turquoise beads, as well as turquoise uh, mosaic shields. <clears throat> So we don't know of any turquoise mines in Mesoamerica, um, but we do know that uh, parts of Mesoamerica, like the Southwest, are very rich in copper, and and the geology doesn't the, the geology of this area um, would certainly make it possible for turquoise deposits to form. Um, we just don't have firm evidence of any specific turquoise deposits in this region. But we do have a lot of evidence for copper and a lot of evidence for copper mining, um, particularly in the period of time we call the late post-classic in Mesoamerica. So this is just a map showing you the location of copper mines um, that were being used um, by Mesoamerican groups at this time. And luckily for us, the, um, the scientists studying these copper mines have measured the lead isotope ratios of these copper ores. And so these lead isotope signatures actually um, give us a sense of if there were turquoise deposits in these region, we would expect them to have the same isotope signatures as the other copper minerals. So this is just a lead isotope plot um, that shows you, for example, the isotope signatures of copper ores from the state of Michoacan in Mexico. If you plot the values of the turquoise tesserae from Tenochtitlan um, on top of these, you see that it's a very, very good match. Um, so not only are the, the Mesoamerican turquoise objects distinct from the, the geologic mines of the Southwest, but their signatures are actually exactly what we would expect them to be if this turquoise was being derived from mines that we just don't have evidence for yet in South America, in um, Central Mexico. And so, um, based on these findings, you know, we can revisit this image from uh, uh, Garmin Harbottle and Phil Weigand, where they posited that turquoise was being moved from the Southwest to Mesoamerica systematically. And maybe we need to reconsider um, uh, these ideas. The isotope evidence um, so far does not support the notion that Southwestern groups traded turquoise to Mesoamerica. The turquoise we've measured in both Aztec and Mixtec objects has an isotope signature that's distinct um, from Southwestern turquoise deposits. And the signature of that turquoise matches exactly what we would expect to see if that turquoise was being mined perhaps somewhere in Western Mexico. And so, um, in closing, I would like to say there's at least no evidence so far of a turquoise trail linking these two regions. Um, uh, although we want to look at turquoise objects from um, other areas and other time periods to really nail down this problem. Um, but this was, uh, uh, this counters essentially, uh, you know, about a century of archaeological thought about how this material um, uh, links between linked these two regions or didn't link them together. So with that, um, uh, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions. If anyone has any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself or if you put it in the chat, I will read it aloud. Alison, thank you for making that something even I could understand. It's very interesting. Anyone have any questions? 
have you gotten any pushback from people that aren't happy with what you found? Um, not really. Um, you know, even the the scientists that you know originally came up with the conclusions linking these two areas in the you know 70s, 80s. So a lot of my turquoise samples, for example, um, actually. Uh, come from the collections of the scientists who tried to do this work originally, you know, and their perspective has largely been, you know, we did the best we had with the, with the best we could with the analytical techniques available to us at the time. Uh, and so it was just a matter of sort of revisiting these questions with new analytical techniques that were better suited to answer them. We do have a question from Scott in the chat. Do you want me to read it aloud or do you see it? I mean, I can, I think maybe we should read it aloud anyways. Um, um, so the, the question is, as, um, uh, as has been done in fingerprinting emerald provinces, could fluid inclusion temperatures and chemistry differentiate the American Southwest from Mesoamerican deposits of copper? Um, so, so these are not magmatic minerals um, or, or hydrothermal minerals where we might see fluid inclusions we could measure temperatures of. Um, and so, um, so I don't know that something like fluid inclusions, it's, it's not the right technique for a mineral like turquoise. Um, just because of how turquoise forms. Turquoise is probably forming at very low um, uh, temperatures in the upper, you know, 30 meters or so of the surface. So there's not, it, it, it's, it's forming from the precipitation groundwater. Um, and so there wouldn't really be a temperature difference. I don't know if I answered the question um, or not. Yeah, you, you, yes, I, I suspected that, but years ago in the past, I, I was involved in some studies that involved looking at fluid inclusions in some uh, uh, calcite deposits that deposited as a result of groundwater precipitation mm -hmm. and sh at shallow depths. Um, they're very, very fine, uh, uh, not as well developed as the ones that develop at higher temperatures that you, like you refer to. But um, I know that, that the techniques for analyzing inclusions have progressed quite a bit since when I was working and I didn't know whether or not uh, there was any possibility that that looking for those might might give you different characteristics that would help add to your evidence of of separating the Southwest Providence from the Mesoamerican Providence. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we would expect to see different temperatures of formation for turquoise in either of these areas. So even if we could measure fluid inclusions, um, the nice thing about the isotope technique, um, even though it is destructive, is that like with mass spectrometers today, you can generate a lot of data fairly quickly. You know, and I always think of fluid inclusion, the little bit of fluid inclusion work I've had experience with, you know, was much more time consuming. So um, uh, I don't... Um, I don't think fluid inclusions would be the right technique for differentiating, but they can differentiate other mineral de other types of mineral deposits quite well. Um, so yeah, it's it's a good thought. Allison, what's the next step in your, in this research? So in the specific research I've shared with you today, um, uh, we'd like to look at Mesoamerican turquoise artifacts from from other parts of Mesoamerica and other time periods. So the artifacts we looked at are kind of restricted to the, the, the decades actually, to just the few decades before the arrival of the Spanish um, in 1521 or so. So we're looking at sort of um, this very late period um, uh, in, the, in the history of Mesoamerica. And it would be interesting to, to look at turquoise from earlier periods and maybe different cultural areas to see whether or not that turquoise derives from the Southwest or has this similar signature to what we see in Aztec or Mishtec context. So our, re our research was limited in sort of its, its temporal ap applicability in terms of what we think about the archeological record. So that's where I would like to 
go next. I am always working on turquoise related projects, sourcing projects. A lot of those projects are within the Southwest. So we're looking at artifacts within the Southwest and thinking about how turquoise is moving around this region we call the greater Southwest. Um, so that's something I'm always working on as well. And then I see, oh. You have two more questions. Um, does the lack of a turquoise trail mean there was no cultural interchange between American Southwest and Mesoamerica? So it doesn't, so we see, for example, objects of clear Mesoamerican origin in the Southwest. Um, so those scarlet macaws, the cacao, um, the copper bells. So it's not that these areas are completely isolated from one another or have no interaction. It's just thinking about like, is that interaction like systematic or, you know, are just materials, you know, trickling maybe back and forth between these regions, like in other, you know, less systematic ways. So, you know, scarlet macaws, copper bells, cacao, we see evidence for this in the Southwest. It, they're, it's not super widespread. So these were probably very valuable materials that weren't widely available. Um, so would have been used in very specific contexts, maybe by specific people. Um, uh, so there was certainly interaction. It's just trying to pin down what's the extent and nature of that interaction. And then are people currently looking for the mines where the different turquoise comes from? So I am in contact with archaeologists and geologists who are working in the relevant parts of Mexico. Um, and we're looking at um, archaeological sites that might have turquoise in them that, you know, would have a good chance of being locally derived in Mesoamerica. And we're trying to determine if there are, if there is any evidence anywhere of these mines. It's possible these mines were once there and they've just been essentially destroyed. It doesn't take much to actually completely obliterate you know, a turquoise deposit from the surface um, if that area has been subject to historical or modern mining. So um, we're trying, um, uh, we're trying to, to, to involve people who would have the expertise to know if we're missing anything. Very good. I don't see any additional questions. Um, so I will thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. Um, to our participants, thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you at some of our upcoming virtual events or in-person events soon. So thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.